I'm excited to now bring back to the stage Embark's own Dr. Jenna Dockweiler. If you didn't have the opportunity to see her earlier talk, it will be available for on-demand viewing after the summit closes. Dr. Dockweiler graduated from Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. She then completed her comparative theriogenology residency at Cornell University in 2017 and became a diplomat of the American College of Theriogenologists that same year. She practiced small animal theriogenology and general practice for four years prior to joining our team here at Embark Veterinary as a veterinary geneticist. In this role, Dr. Dockweiler supports our many partners across the veterinary and breeder communities, helping them interpret and apply canine genetic screening results. As a reminder, all attendees can post questions and comments in the chat during the presentation. Dr. Dockweiler will answer as many as she can during the live Q&A after her presentation. Also, for our veterinary attendees, by attending this talk today, you are eligible to receive one hour of race-approved CE credit. We will send an email after the event to all attendees with instructions on how to request a certificate of attendance. Welcome again, Dr. Jenna Dockweiler. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, again, my name is Jenna Dockweiler. I'm one of the veterinary geneticists here at Embark, and we are going to be talking about responsible breeding of the bitch in this hour. So here is the outline of everything that we're going to, to discuss today, from breeding candidacy all the way to Utosha. So some of the basics of responsible breeding are each generation improves upon the last. Typically, responsible breeders will have homes available prior to breeding. Typically, will mandate sterilization of pet quality offspring, and they will be responsible throughout the lifetime of the offspring. My older dog is 10 years old, and if I were to call his breeder tomorrow and say, I can't keep him, she would say, send him back. So definitely responsible throughout the entire lifetime. They do provide socialization and exposure for those puppies, so oftentimes those puppies will come at least partially crate trained, potty trained. They'll get them out into the world, expose them to new textures, surfaces, stairs, things like that. And often they'll follow like a socialization procedure, so it's something like puppy culture or Avidog. They will do brucellosis testing on all of their breeding stock, which we'll talk about in more detail here in a moment. And they will also do health testing on, on all of their breeding stock. So general principles of health testing, the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals is kind of our, our parent organization, if you will. It does have a list of tests by breed that you can go on the website and search. The testing recommendations by breed do come from the parent club for that breed. So there isn't any involvement of OFA or AKC or any veterinary regulatory bodies. So that's just one little weakness in, in the system. So for example, if you're a Sky Terrier, you don't have any health problems, so there's no health testing required for that breed. So you do have to be a little bit careful. It is a public database, and I say kind of because all normal results will be published, but the owner actually has to initial on the form if they will allow abnormal results to be published on the database. So I always encourage everybody to initial that spot because it's important to be transparent but some people are a bit more reputable than others. There are a lot of phenotypic and genetic tests listed, as well as instructions on how to perform those phenotypic tests and labs to do those genetic tests through. So phenotypic health testing tests based on the individual animal. So examples would be hips, elbows, patellas, shoulders, eyes, that sort of thing. They don't identify the genetic makeup of the animal. So these are often polygenic or poorly understood traits or traits that have an environmental component to them. And of course, we can't identify the carriers if we're not able to identify the genetic makeup. So OFA hips are probably the most common phenotypic health test that, that we do in dogs. So it is a single hip extended VD in dogs at least two years of age. It is a consensus based on three radiologists' opinions. Comes back as a qualitative score. So scores of excellent, good, or fair are considered passing. And then there are varying degrees of dysplasia with modifiers to that. So unilateral, bilateral, subluxation, arthritis, that sort of thing. 
You don't need any special training as a veterinarian. 95% of the time, we don't need any sedation to take these x-rays, and it is relatively inexpensive to perform. But it doesn't pr provide any information on hip laxity, which is actually the underlying cause of hip dysplasia in dogs. So I'm not a radiologist, but I do want to point out this x-ray here. This is my own dog. So if you look at his left hip, he has good coverage of that femoral head. That ball is well seated into that socket, nice and smooth, very narrow femoral neck, and no arthritis along the acetabular rim. But if you look at that right side, it looks a little bit subluxated, so definitely less than 50% coverage of that femoral head. It's not seated quite as well into that socket. He does have a bit of a thicker femoral neck on that side, and he does have some osteophyte formation on that acetabular rim. So the other big hip test that we do is the Pennsylvania Hip Improvement Program, or PEN-HIP. So this will actually test for laxity, which is the underlying cause of hip dysplasia in dogs. So all dogs are born with radiographically normal hips but some are looser than others, which allows subluxation of that ball from that socket. So the body's response to that laxity is to lay down new bone in an attempt to stabilize that joint. So that's where hip dysplasia develops. So we do take three views. We take a compression uh, and a distraction view. So push the hips as far into the socket as they'll go, and then we use a hip distractor to gently pull them out of the socket, which is what this x-ray is, is portraying here. And then we'll also do a hip extended VD, the same as the OFA view, just to look for any obvious arthritis or things that will preclude normal distraction of those hips. So this is Mason again. As you can see, that left hip barely distracted at all from that socket. It's still pretty tightly seated in there, whereas that right side pulled out quite a bit farther. So the distraction index is calculated from the difference between the compression and the distraction view. So the result comes back as a numerical value that's compared to other individuals of the same breed. So the downsides are this is much more expensive. It does require very heavy sedation, even bordering on general anesthesia. There is no public database, and veterinarians who perform it do have to do some training. It is free, but it is something that you have to do. But the good side is that it, there's really good interoperator consistency among trained operators, and you can perform it on puppies as young as 16 weeks, and that distraction index is not likely to change throughout life. And it's much easier to apply selection pressure on a number versus a qualitative score. If you want to touch on genetic health testing a little bit, so this will identify alleles associated with disease. So the results will come back at risk. So these are some examples of, of at-risk scenarios, depending on the mode of inheritance of a disease in question, or carrier, so one copy of autosomal recessive typically is what a carrier is, or clear, so no copies of the disease allele. This is a prognostic test, not a diagnostic test, so it comes back as at-risk, not affected, and depending on the disease, some of them will have very high penetrance. So if you have two copies of that disease allele, you will almost certainly go on to develop the disease, while others are, are a little bit more, more hit or miss. Depending on which test you utilize, you can also determine the coefficient of inbreeding. A pedigree-based COI, which is what most breeders will use, is based on five to 10 generations. They attribute 50% of the DNA to each parent. But in reality, recombination occurs, and the founding breed members are often related to one another, so we can't start from zero. These tests often, often, will often identify colors and traits as well, which are important in some circumstances, especially like Merle. All right, we're going to touch base on canine brucellosis here. So what is Brucella canis? This is a small coxobacillus bacteria. It is non-modal, gram-negative aerobic, and facultatively intracellular. Interestingly, it's also non-endotoxic. So lipopolysaccharide, non-endotoxic. This is considered a rough brucella, which means that that LPS takes on a rough appearance in colonies grown for greater than 48 hours. This is associated with impaired intracellular survival in vitro. So it has lower levels of cytokine expression, so it is less virulent. This was first discovered in 1966 during investigation of abortions in a beagle kennel. So as far as who can become infected, of course, domestic dogs and other canids are the, the normal hosts for this bacteria. 
but other unrelated species can become infected as well. Cats tend to be pretty resistant, but especially in laboratory conditions, it's been found in a lot of species. And importantly, humans can become infected with Brucella canis as well. Typically, the bacteria is transmitted by contact with genital, conjunctival, and oronasal mucosal secretions. All bodily fluids are considered infectious, including saliva, tears, urine, but the highest number of organisms is going to be in the reproductive secretion, so especially post-abortion material and semen. Altered animals are less likely to transmit based on this, but it is still possible. Less common modes of transmission would be transplacental, transmammary, and breaks in the skin, or even blood transfusion. So those bacteria will penetrate the mucous membranes where they're then taken up by macrophages. Those organisms do reside intracellularly, which makes them a bit difficult to detect and a bit difficult to treat. So they will then travel to local lymph nodes, spleen, liver, which leads to bacteremia. So the blood culture typically becomes positive about two to four weeks post-infection. That bacteremia usually will persist for about 30 weeks and then become intermittent thereafter. It does target the reproductive tissue. That's why there's the highest number of organisms in reproductive secretions. But non-reproductive organs can also be infected. Signs and symptoms, so in bitches, we often will see abortion, typically late-term abortion, usually seven to nine weeks of gestation. Sometimes we can see early embryonic death, which really clinically just looks like infertility because we can't detect pregnancy in the dog until about 30 days of gestation or so. Sometimes we will see birth of weak or stillborn pups. Sometimes we will see birth of apparently normal pups, which either go on to remain asymptomatic or will develop symptoms later in life. Or bitches can also be completely asymptomatic. For dogs, a lot of times we'll see epididymitis, scrotal edema, and scrotal dermatitis, often from licking. They can have teratospermia, which can lead to infertility, and they can also be asymptomatic. Some non-reproductive signs, uveitis, discospondylitis is a popular one. We can see lymphadenopathy. This is a dog with lymphoma, but you can see enlarged lymph nodes with brucellosis as well. Sometimes they're just ADR, kind of nonspecific symptoms. Fever is not typically characteristic of canine brucellosis, although it can occur. And these, these guys can also be completely asymptomatic, which is the scary part. So diagnosis, culture is the gold standard. So blood, semen, vaginal discharge, aborted tissues, fetuses, urine are all good mediums for culture. But the sensitivity is pretty limited by the low number of organisms and intermittent shedding. Additionally, due to the human health risk, we don't often hospitalize these guys to take blood cultures over three time periods like we would want to do. Just don't like to keep them in hospital and exposing staff to the organism. It is also pretty fastidious and slow growing. It does need to be sent to a special lab to, to grow the bacteria and placed on special media. So we do rely mostly on serologic assays for diagnosis. So a rapid slide agglutination test is probably the most common. That's what's depicted here. So in circle three here on the left, we have a, a positive control. So that is supposed to agglutinate, and it is. And then circle four is an example of a, a negative test here. So that's, there's no agglutination on that side. And then on the right side with these two cards here, this is another example of a positive test. So circle one, we've got that positive control. Circle two, we have the patient sample, which is also agglutinating. There is quite a lot of cross reactivity with this RSAT with various things like Bordetella, so certain species of staph and strep can cross react. So we add two mercaptoethanol to our patient sample to try to decrease some of that cross reactivity. And that's what's depicted in circle three here. So of course, this patient is still agglutinating. So that is a presumed positive. And then we, we confirmed with an AGID, which I'll talk about in a moment here. You can also do a tube agglutination test that will come back with a tighter result with a greater than one to 200 considered positive. You can also do an immunofluorescent antibody. These guys all have very high sensitivity, but fairly low specificity. So they are considered screening tests. If you have a negative result, you can typically trust it unless you've tested very acutely during the acute phases before they have time to build up antibody. 
So false negatives, test in acute phase of disease, low levels of circulating antibodies in very chronic disease. So the AGID is typically what we turn to next. So this is a very purified cytoplasmic antigen that it's testing for. So very little to no cross-reaction. It's a confirmatory test, very sensitive and very specific. How about prevalence? Well, it's a little bit hard to say what the prevalence is. There was a retrospective study that was done in Michigan, which showed that non-commercial breeders, meaning hobby breeders, had a prevalence of 0.4%, whereas commercial breeders, which is a, a polite way of saying puppy mill, had a prevalence of 9 to 83% in each population. They did another study on shelter dogs in Mississippi that found 35% of shelters did house seropositive dogs. And the overall prevalence in those seropositive shelters was 17.8%. So treatment is actually not recommended for these guys. The goal is definitely remission. Relapse is very common in these guys. They do need to be spayed or neutered if they're not already. Typically involves long courses of antibiotics. There's a paper showing that Batril was effective. Uh, some people will use combination therapies, doxycycline and rifampin, um, but typically they're on them for a long period of time. As far as biosecurity goes, we do need to test all new arrivals, we need to test breeding dogs every six months. And how about artificial insemination? Well, of course, that's going to protect the dog from the bitch, naturally. But that extender may or may not kill the, the bacteria that causes brucellosis. And it can actually survive the freezing process. So certainly extender and semen freezing is not guaranteed to protect the bitch from the dog. Good news is it is susceptible to most disinfectants in the environment. It really doesn't like to live outside of the body. So it's susceptible to sunlight and desiccation as well. Really the two places that it lives for any kind of extended period of time would be damp soil for up to about four months and then tap water for up to about 90 days. How about vaccination? There's no dog or human vaccine available. If uh, you think back to vet school, there is a vaccine for Brucella abortus, it's RB51. It's only licensed for dairy heifers between four to 12 months of age, and even that is a bit dependent on your state. It is a DIVA vaccine, so we can differentiate from natural infection, but it's not 100% effective. It's actually goal is to just decrease abortion, not even to decrease infection. And there is a human health risk if you have an inadvertent needle poke with, with this vaccine. So human infections can occur through contact, through direct contact with infected dogs, body fluids, or reproductive secretions. Most cases are associated with people's pet dogs, but laboratory exposure is also possible. The prevalence is 100 to 150 cases of human brucellosis that's diagnosed per year. That's all species, not just brucella canis. So what about brucella canis? It's really hard to say. It's probably underdiagnosed. There's a pretty low index of suspicion. And then those clinical signs will mimic, mimic other diseases. Usually people will get undulating fever with brucellosis. And that rough LPS actually complicates the diagnosis. So that serologic testing usually tests for the smooth LPS specifically. So brucella canis and brucella ovis are not going to be detected in those assays. So you have to ask for them specifically. The good news is Brucella canis is less pathogenic than other species, um, but the young, the elderly, and the immunocompromised are still definitely susceptible, and it can be associated with some pretty bad complications. And treatment in humans is, of course, prolonged courses of, of antibiotics. So this is all a very long way of saying that Brucella canis is out there, and we need to keep testing our breeding dogs. I think after somebody has so many negative tests, there's a, a tendency to try to get a little bit complacent, but we do need to keep testing them to make sure it doesn't end up in a kennel. It's a risk to both dogs and humans and not just breeding dogs. And really for most dogs, it does end up being a death sentence, especially if they relapse with symptoms and if they're around any humans that are at risk. All right, we're gonna switch gears and, and go to a happier subject, which is the estrus cycle. So there are four stages of the estrus cycle in the bitch. They are proestrus, estrus, diestrus and anestrus. Some texts 
next we'll point to a metaestrus, really that just describes early diestrus, and we'll talk about why that's not a perfectly appropriate term for the bitch in just a minute. Typically, they will have two cycles per year. There are a few notable exceptions. The Senjis are an example. Tibetan Mastiffs only tend to cycle once per year. So really anywhere between six to 12 months between cycles is considered pretty normal. So during proestrus, you are going to see serosanguinous vulvar discharge. That's what your owners are going to notice. You're going to see vulvar swelling and attraction of a male as well. And she's going to exhibit what's called proceptive behavior. So she'll be flirty, she'll play with boys, but she won't actually allow mounting. Duration lasts an average of nine days. The range is reportedly six to 11. And hormonally, estrogen is dominant at this phase. So you can see that blue line there, that is estrogen. Apologies for the picture, I did draw this. So it is not a great work of art, but it gets the point across. That estrogen is going to peak one to two days prior to the onset of estrus. During estrus, you're going to see that the bitch is going to be standing for breeding. So that is the biggest difference. She's going to be flagging, which is the, a reproductive reflex, essentially. So you tickle the inside of the thigh. She should move her tail to the side and tip the vulva dorsally. Technically, the vulvar discharge should change from serosanguinous to straw colored. I can tell you that happens in practice probably about 50% of the time. Uh, some of them tend to bleed straight on through and doesn't seem to be associated with any kind of infertility. But the textbooks will tell you that it's supposed to change to straw colored discharge. You only have to remember one number for both proestrus and estrus. The average here is nine days as well but the range is one to 20. So some bitches will only allow mounting for a very short period of time, while others will allow mounting for a very long period of time. Uh, so all of these stages were named before we had hormonal assays at our disposal. So we kind of shoehorned the hormones into, into these stages afterwards, if you will. So the LH surge, which is that purple spike there, is gonna initiate ovulation within 24 to 48 hours. Those CLs or corpora lutea are going to form at those sites of ovulation, and the progesterone is continue, going to continue to rise. So dogs have pre-ovulatory luteinization of that follicle. So at ovulation, the progesterone is usually around four to six nanograms per mil, and it will continue to rise from there. During diestrus, we have progesterone levels that'll increase for a couple of weeks. They're going to plateau for a couple of weeks and then they're going to wane over about 10 to 30 days or so. And the cause of why this, this waning happens is pretty unclear in open bitches. Uh, we don't know why exactly that occurs, but it does occur. So important to note that those CLs are functional in the absence of pregnancy. So we cannot rely on progesterone as a pregnancy diagnostic tool in the dog. So we can use a different blood test called relaxin. So relaxin is produced by the placenta exclusively in the dog. So we can use this for, for pregnancy diagnosis. Relaxin is responsible for relaxation of the interpubic ligament and some of the other soft tissues um, in preparation for whelping. So we talked about metaestrus describing early diestrus. Really metaestrus describes the time period between ovulation and CL dominance. But because dogs have pre-ovulatory luteinization of that follicle and their progesterone is already essentially double what they need to sustain a pregnancy, uh, metaestrus isn't a super appropriate term in this species, so we don't use it. During anestrus, we have uterine involution, and this is going to occur after a litter, after a false pregnancy, and even after a normal estrus cycle. So, it has to be at least about 90 days. If we get shorter than about four and a half months between cycles, we do start to see infertility issues due to inadequate endometrial repair. All right, let's talk about breeding management of the bitch. So generally speaking, we usually start monitoring them on about day to three to five of their cycle after the owner notices some vulvar discharge. Typically, we'll monitor them every two to three days. Ideally, we would do progesterone, vaginal cytology, and vaginoscopy on every monitoring period. Most people hang their hats on progesterone. Uh, so if I had to pick one, it would be that. It is pretty difficult to determine the exact stage of the cycle based on a single day. So you typically do need serial monitoring for these girls. Behavior can be really unreliable, both on the bitch side and on the dog side. So on the bitch side, like we talked about, they could be in estrus for anywhere from one to 20 days. 
So of course, if she's standing to be mounted for 20 days, she's not fertile for those whole 20 days. So we can't rely on her. And boys tend to get excited if the bitch smells different for any reason. So that could certainly be a heat cycle, but that also could certainly be something like a urinary tract infection. Even an ear infection, sometimes the boys are unreliable. So we can't, can't count on him either. So progesterone timing, our baseline is less than one nanogram per mil. At the time of the LH peak, that progesterone will raise to two to two and a half nanograms per mil. You can measure LH directly. It's a little bit of a pain because it has to be done every day. So usually people will just use progesterone as kind of an LH proxy. If you have your date of ovulation, it'll be four to six nanograms per mil. And then the ideal time to breed is going to be four to seven days post LH peak. So ovulation occurs about two days after that LH peak. And then the dog ovulates primary oocytes, which takes about 48 hours to mature into a secondary oocyte that's ready for fertilization. So there's no, no real sense in breeding them bef much before two days after the LH peak. With fresh or fresh chilled semen, you have much more flexibility. But with frozen, you do need to wait as long as possible. So that's when we're waiting more like seven days post LH peak. And the reason for that is frozen is just much less hardy. We only count on it to live in the bitch tract for about 12 hours or so. So we want to make sure to wait as long as possible, have as many eggs there ready, waiting for, for a semen, uh, a sperm cell to, to fertilize. The number one cause of infertility in the bitch is actually poorly timed breeding. So this progesterone timing is really important, even those in those bitches that are bred by natural cover. The other reason that we like to do progesterone timing in all bitches, even if they're bred by natural cover, is for estimation of due date. So if you have a date of LH peak, so either when the progesterone hits two to two and a half, or if you've been measuring it directly, the due date is 65 plus or minus one day from that date. You have your date of ovulation, 63 plus or minus one, one to two days. So the LH peak occurs, and then two days later, ovulation occurs. Makes sense. You have a vaginal cytology, so day one diestrus, 57 plus or minus three days. So still pretty good, but we're definitely getting into a wider window here. But if all you have is a breeding date, 63 plus or minus seven days from the date of first breeding. So that is a two-week window and a nine-week gestation, which is a crazy level of error. So I definitely recommend doing progesterone timing in everybody, both for the, the timing of the breeding to make sure we're as successful as possible, and also on the back end, knowing if we're in trouble or not if she goes overdue. This is because we've got a long receptive period in the bitch in a lot of cases. And that semen is pretty hardy in the bitch tract if it's fresh or fresh chilled. There's a study that showed uh, semen remained in the bitch tract for a couple of days and no decreased concentrations and an additional 11 days and only minorly decreased concentrations. So it can hang out for quite a long time if it's good quality. Artificial insemination options. Of course, you have vaginal. And you can use a Mavic catheter, which is a catheter with a little balloon on the end that simulates the tie or just a regular AI pipette. Vaginal insemination deposits the semen into the front part of the vagina, which is where the dog were to put it, would he, were he to breed her naturally. Can't use frozen, unfortunately, with vaginal insemination. It's just not hardy enough to pass that cervical barrier. So we do need to do an intrauterine insemination for frozen semen. And we do have a couple of options for that. The first is transcervical insemination, which is what this picture is of here. I did probably 95% of my, uh, my breeding via transcervical insemination. It doesn't require any sedation. They typically stand for it and are perfectly fine. Uh, just awake with somebody kind of talking to the front end and feeding treats. And then, of course, you can use surgical insemination as well. But I, I was much better at doing TCIs than doing surgical inseminations, and you avoid the anesthesia. So pregnancy rates reportedly with natural are about 80%. With chilled are also about 80%, so both quite good. But with frozen, only about 70%, and only 6% if we do a, a vaginal insemination with frozen semen. So that's definitely unacceptably low, so we do need to deposit that semen in the uterus somehow. So the minimum breeding dose in the dog is 100 to 200 million sperm cells. Typically, that low of a dose is going to be frozen semen. Uh, usually, we'll use more for, for fresh or fresh chill. 
Normal dogs will produce at least 100 million per 10 pounds of body weight. So for example, a 60 pound dog should have at least 600 million sperm cells. Typically they will have more than that in the ejaculate. At least 70% should be moving normally and at least 80% should be morphologically normal. This two-headed sperm is obviously not morphologically normal, but I thought he was cute, so I wanted to include him. All right, we're gonna to switch to vaginal cytology for, for a few minutes here. So vaginal cytology is useful to estimate the due date, 57 plus or minus three days from day one diestrus, like we talked about, can help time the onset of estrus if no male is present and the signs are pretty limited in the bitch. You can follow changes in bitches with subfertility and you can find weird stuff. So this picture actually is of a dog that presented to me as a referral case for continued bleeding post so the story was she was in heat when she was taken in by rescue. The rescue spayed her and she essentially never stopped bleeding after even she was spayed. So that is, of course, a transmissible venereal tumor, which is not super uncommon in the southwestern United States where there are a big free roaming populations of dogs that interbreed freely. So, of course, she had a, a different problem. She wasn't in heat at all. She just had a bleeding tumor. So that vaginal epithelium is gonna increase in thickness from a few cells thick in very early proestrus to about 30 cells thick at the end of proestrus, and that is due to estrogen. That change is gonna result in sloughing of those superficial cells, increasing the impervious nature to leukocyte migration through the vaginal wall. So typically those red blood cells will come from the uterus and the leukocytes will come across the vaginal wall. And it's gonna protect from injury at the time of mating. This vaginal cytology is another example of find cool stuff. The question here was, did they breed? And the answer was, why, yes, they did. You won't always see sperm cells on vaginal cytology post-copulation, but when you do, it's a, a pretty solid indicator that they bred and he ejaculated. So during pro-estrus, you're going to see increasing cornification as those cells are moving for, further from their blood supply. So when they're right up against their blood supply, they're round, they're happy, their nuclei are nice and plump, but as they move further away, they're, they're going to get more angular cell borders, they're going to get more pycnotic nuclei. We'll also see some red blood cells, can see some neutrophils, and also are going to see background debris, typically that cervical or vaginal mucus. During estrus, you're going to see essentially 100% cornified as they're the furthest from the blood supply. Some references will say 90%, some references will say 95%, some will say 100, so we'll call it greater than 90 to 100, usually all of them. You might see red blood cells because again, not all of them change the straw color discharge like the textbooks say they should, but you really shouldn't see any white blood cells at this point because that vaginal wall is really thick and increases that impervious nature to leukocyte migration across it. During diestrus, you're going to see a sharp decrease in the number of cornified cells. So the magnitude of this decrease depends on who you ask. Some references will say greater than 20% decrease. Some references will say greater than 50% decrease. It's typically not subtle, especially if you've been following it every day. This is really tough to distinguish from proestrus without a progesterone. So during proestrus, that progesterone is going to be very low typically less than about four to six nanograms per mil, often less than that even, and in diestrus it's going to be high. During anestrus, you're gonna see uh, essentially 100% non-cornified cells, you're gonna see parabasal and intermediate cells, can sometimes see neutrophils. Technically, you're not supposed to see any red blood cells because if the bitch is not in estrus, there's no red blood cells coming down from the uterus. However, this anestrus wall is really thin, really susceptible to trauma, so sometimes you can have iatrogenic blood contamination in these swabs. All right, vaginoscopy next. So hormonal changes are also going to alter the fluid retention properties of that mucosa. So that can be used to define critical time points in the estrus cycle. So during pro-estrus, you're going to see two stages of changes. In the early stage, those folds of the vaginal mucosa are going to become edematous, which is what this picture is portraying here. But during the later stages, we're going to have a shrinkage of those folds when they become less edematous. During estrus, that shrinkage is going to intensify and maximize. So that's what that picture is showing here. And then by the end, those folds are maximally shrunken and angulated, or what we call crenulated. So this is likened to the appearance of an old lady's hand, which is a kind of gross but pretty apt description of what it really looks like. 
During diesterous, you're going to see a rounding out or smoothing of that vaginal mucosa, which is what this, uh, this picture is representing here. During anesterous, that vaginal mucosa, again, is going to be thin, flat, susceptible to trauma. So you can see all the little blood vessels through, through the wall here. That uh, structure down the middle is the dorsal median fold, and then the cervix is in the back there. Typically, they're not this bloody. I don't have a lot of occasion to scope anesterous stitches. So this one actually was another TVT patient. So that blood is just coming from the tumor, but it was a good example of what an anesterous vaginoscopy looks like. All right, so how about pregnancy diagnosis in the dog? So ultrasound is probably the, the gold standard of pregnancy diagnosis. So you can see that embryonic vesicle by about day 21 to 23. Typically can see a heartbeat by about day 24 to 25, placenta by day 28, and fetal movement by day 35. And these are all dependent on uh, how good your ultrasound machine is as well. Radiography, you can see as early as day 45, mineralized fetuses. I like to wait until later. They're much easier to count and easier to see the later we wait. And since I've already done an ultrasound and diagnosed her pregnant, we're really just doing the x-ray as a, a puppy count. So I like to wait until about day 60 or so. Can also use that relaxin, that blood test assay. That can be done at about day 30 or so. And you can do abdominal palpation. Some people do rely on this. That can be done as early as day 25. Do you have to be a little bit careful? Pyometra can also have a string of pearls feel, which feels very similar to fetuses in the uterus. All right, last topic, we're gonna to talk about utosha. And if you came to the reproductive emergencies lectures, this is going to be uh, a little familiar to you. So apologies for that. So 60% of fetuses are delivered in cranial presentation and 40% are delivered in caudal. Both are totally normal as long as all of our limbs are extended. So both forelimbs and hind limbs totally extended. Some people will call caudal presentation breach. It's not actually a true breach unless those hips are flexed forward. Stage one parturition begins when those uterine contractions start. These are not typically externally visible, but if you put a tocodynomanometer on, which you can rent in the United States, uh, you will see them on a trace. And it ends when that cervix is fully dilated. So typically the average is six to 12 hours for this stage of parturition, can be up to 24 to 36 hours, especially in primiferous bitches. Stage two parturition begins with complete dilation of the cervix, which by the way is not palpable in the bitch, so you're not gonna be able to feel that, and ends with delivery of a fetus. So this really shouldn't take more than about 30 minutes per fetus, and if it is taking more than 30 minutes per fetus, that is cause for concern. Then stage three parturition is, begins after expulsion of the fetus and ends with expulsion of the placenta. So stages two and three occur simultaneously in the dog as well as the cat. It is very common to get two puppies followed by two placentas. The thought is that a puppy will come down from one horn, then a puppy will come down from the opposite horn, and then a placenta will come down from each horn as well. As an aside, we try to get placentas away from the bitch before she's able to eat them. There's never been a proven benefit to allowing her to eat them, and it does cause diarrhea, which is a pain to deal with when you've got nursing puppies. So we try to get them away. They're very fast. Uh, retained placenta is pretty uncommon in this species. So if you have somebody that's missing a placenta, either she ate it very quickly before the owner noticed, or it'll pass probably on its own. So puppy care, we do need a contact surface for them of 85 to 95 degrees. I like to use uh, heating pads for this purpose rather than heat lamps, which can cause dehydration and burns. These guys do need to nurse within six hours. Uh, those brown fat reserves will be depleted by that point, and they do also need colostrum, cat feed colostrum as well. They are going to need access to milk every two hours, and we are going to need to weigh those puppies daily. So they should gain about 5 to 10% of their birth weight each day. A really common mistake for people to make is to calculate 5 to 10% of their daily weight, which of course is an exponential increase as time goes on. So the number will be the same for about the first three or so weeks of life that they should be gaining each day.
All right, I have a lot of references. <laughs> so these are all of my references, and I can certainly get you those on request. And with that, I will take any questions. All right, thank you so much for that, Dr. Dockweiler. Um, we have some questions from our live audience, but I do wanna remind people that they are welcome to still uh, use the Q&A box in the screen and, and submit questions. We'll see how many we can get through. The first one is actually a perfect segue for the topic of responsible breeding practices. It's, um, it's specifically about a, a genetic test in a specific breed, um, but it's really more about um, how should we responsibly be thinking about using test results, genetic and potentially phenotypic, um, and how realistic is it to expect that you get only completely clear dogs of everything that we can test for to breed? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, thank you all for joining me. And certainly if I don't get to all of your questions, my email address is on that last slide there. So feel free to shoot me an email with any questions I don't get to. And as far as how we apply genetic results to a breeding program, I assume we're talking about an autosomal recessive trait, so a trait in which a carrier would not be expected to show symptoms of the disease. And in that case, we do want to keep breeding those individuals, but we just wanna make sure we breed them to, to dogs that are clear of that trait so that we don't produce at-risk puppies. Um, it's not realistic to think that we can get rid of these genes completely, and doing so actually can close the gene pool even further than what it already is and lead to other issues. So if carriers are not clinically affected, then it's most responsible to keep them in your breeding program. Perfect. And is there a different recommendation or does it end up being breed specific for things that are not necessarily recessive or that are risk predictors versus um, things that are telling you you're definitely going to get a dog affected with the condition? Yeah, it depends on on the breed. So dominant traits where a dog with the one copy of the, of the gene is expected to show the trait, we wouldn't want to breed that dog because they would produce at-risk puppies regardless of if they were bred to a, a dog with no copies. So it depends a little bit on the, the trait. Um, but for autosomal recessive, we definitely want to keep, breed, keep carriers in our gene pool. Great. I know as a breeder, um, when I first started out, I had a really different sort of black and white feeling about this. And then the more you learn and the more you're exposed to, um, yep. yeah, it would be great if we could only ever have completely clear dogs, but I don't think that's biologically achievable. No, it's not um, So a second question is around due dates and how do breeding dates, whether that's one or two or an ex extended number of breeding dates over an extended period of time, how do they impact when you should uh, expect puppies to be born? So the breeding date doesn't affect when the bitch ovulates, nothing like that. So if you have a date of ovulation, it's 63 plus or minus one to two days from that date, regardless of how many days before or after she was bred. So that's really what, what we hang our hat on to predict uh, due date. Perfect. Um, Here's a little bit of a specific one regarding breeding methods. Uh, with frozen semen, is it better to use surgical or transcervical? So it depends a little bit on the operator in that case. So for, for me, transcervical was always the way to go. I've done way more of those than any surgeries. Uh, so in my hands, that's the better way to go. If you have somebody who doesn't have the equipment or the skill to do a transcervical, then surgical would be the way to go. Um, but there shouldn't be a difference in pregnancy rate with a skilled operator for TCI versus surgical. This even gets to exactly the same place in either scenario. Great. Uh, the questions keep rolling in. I know we don't have a lot of time, but maybe we can knock a couple of, of uh, straightforward ones out. One is around, can you speak to how predictive OFA versus pen hip uh, phenotypic tests are for hips? Yeah, so pen hip is definitely the, the better predictor of uh, hip arthritis in the future. So I actually saw this question come through as we were, we were talking here. So um, I pulled up the study for you. So this is a study from 2010 in JASMA, and these numbers that they were looking at were between 1987 and 2008. So this is a bit of an older study. But this study found that 14% of dogs with excellent scores by OFA, 52% of those had a distraction index of greater than 0.3. 
And 0 0.3 is kind of the cutoff. Like if you have a distraction index of less than 0.3, you're almost certainly not going to develop any hip arthritis. And then after that, it gets a little bit fuzzier. So 14% was excellent. How did the 52% of those had distraction index of 0.3? So 82% had OFA rated good hips um, and had a DI range of greater than 0.3. And then 94% with fair hips had a DI range of greater than 0.3. So those are all passing scores according to OFA. So pen hip is definitely the more predictive of the two tests. Um, but as we discussed in the, the presentation, there are some weaknesses with it as well in terms of the transparency and the cost and the anesthesia and, and things that are required to do it. Perfect. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. We have questions still rolling in, some really excellent questions. So I would encourage everyone to take Dr. Duckweiler up on her, uh, her offer to answer your questions uh, after the fact. And I do want to let everyone know that Coming up, there are two presentations. One is Dr. Marty Greer speaking on uh, canine genetic testing and incorporating that into patient health planning and treatment. And the other is Dr. Bonnet speaking on breeding healthy puppies and sustaining your breed. Um, so go check those out. Don't uh, take the opportunity of the break when it comes later to click around and check out the event space. And uh, thanks so much for attending. Feel free to share hashtag canine health summit on uh, social media to let everyone know that you're here. Thanks everyone. Thanks Dr. Dockweiler. Thank you.